Hey guys, I'm Mike from the Comic Nerd here again. Uh, as you can tell, we're not in the car. Or I'm not in the car, I should say. Uh, this is really supposed to be a me and Grant review, but uh, Grant got Grant just came back from vacation. He, he caught some kind of nasty bug, so he couldn't catch the earlier show times. Now he decided uh, his girlfriend wanted to go see it too, so he had to postpone it. But it was one of those things taking too long. I know this is a big movie, and we'll all get the review out here, so... Uh, I was like, okay, fine, I'll do it by myself. Uh, so, of course, I am talking about Ant-Man, which is the big uh, last Marvel movie, uh, Phase 2, before they get in Phase 3, see how that holds up. I have high hopes for Phase 3. But, anywho, uh, so Ant-Man, uh, there's a lot of, there's kind of a lot of back and forth this one. Some say it's really, like, one of the best Marvel's ever done. Some say it's, like, it's good, but it's not that good. Um... Uh, I'm kind of more in the latter category. <laughs> Hopefully, I'll have more to say about this one than I did. Uh, selfless, um, but I liked Ant Man. I thought Ant Man was good. I think, given what it was trying to do, and given the, what they had to work with, I think they did some a lot, a lot of uh, really good things. I have heard a lot of people uh, kind of say like, "What's we could have been? What's we should have been?" I, I kind of feel like people, some people were expecting way too much from this movie uh, because, for me, like. I just wanted Ant Man to be good. I mean, like it's it's Ant Man. He's I mean he's a good comic book character in the comics, but at the same time, a character with a name like that and his power set is really difficult to translate on screen. So the fact that I can do it in a way that's acceptable and interesting and fun is successful in my book. Now, is this the best Marvel movie they've ever made? No. Uh, but for for what they did and what they had to work with, I think they did a very good job. Um, so, like I said, this is probably a better review if somebody's with me, but I'll do the best I can. Uh, so, of course, for those who don't know what this movie is, is, um, about, I do kind of have to tell a story, I do kind of tell my story about me going to see this movie, because I went to go see this movie, because I was, I've had to deal with some personal issues this week, so I was like, okay, I need to get out of the house for a while, go see Ant Man by myself, and, uh, when I got the ticket, I accidentally walked into it. <laughs> I went to the first the room that was playing the movie. I just assumed it was mine, and I was already like a couple minutes late to the showtime, so I th I didn't wasn't too surprised. When I walked in the movie was already started, but apparently uh, the showtime I walked into was like an hour into the movie, so it was like in the deep dramatic shit <laughs> in the middle of the movie, and I'm just I'm just like. Jesus, what did I miss in those first five minutes? I mean, that was like, it's a fucking killer five minutes. I was only, I thought they were going to do like a flash forward flashback thing where they're just like something that happens in the middle of the movie and then they're going to flash back to the beginning of the movie. But then I realized, like, I kept watching. I was like, I am missing something. Something is wrong. So I finally looked at my ticket. I was like, oh, wait a minute. I'm in the wrong theater. So I quickly run over to the next one and just barely got there right as, right as the movie started. Uh, so I guess I can't spoil it for myself in some way. Uh, so this one, this one stars, uh, Hank Pym, played by Michael Douglas. By the way, great fucking casting in this movie. Uh, Michael Douglas, I loved him at, I loved him as Hank Pym. He's perfect for this version of the character. Uh, in comparison to the comic book ones, I, I'm kind of, I think the comic book version is much more of a douche. <laughs> At least this one's kind of likable. I mean, Hank Pym is played up as a douche here, too, but he's more of a sympathetic douche. Uh, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, I've never been in Hank Pym's camp. Uh, but anyway, uh, he's apparently, he used to work for S.H.I.E.L.D. as Ant-Man, as this kind of like a Cold War hero, along with his wife, Janet, uh, Janet, who was, of course, the Wasp. And the Wasp does make an appearance in this movie, and spoiler alert... Uh, they tease that Hope Van Dyne, which is, uh, their daughter, becomes Wasps at the very end. Uh, I've heard some complaints about this, and I, I'm gonna take a couple minutes to address this before I get into the rest of the plot, because I'm not gonna lie, some of the complaints on this one, I get it, but at the same time, I think people take it a little too seriously. Uh, like, some people's like, well, why didn't, uh, why didn't she become Wasp earlier? Why, why couldn't she do that? And... Why couldn't they do this? Why couldn't they do that? And at the same time, like, the reason why they don't let Hope get into the battle make, like, it makes sense in the logic of the movie. I, it, the reason they gave worked for me, like, I, I was okay with it, because the whole thing is Hank Pym lost Janet because uh, he let, he blames himself because he let her become the Wasp, and uh, now he wants to protect his daughter, even though his daughter knows how to work the Amic costume. 
Kakashi. He knows she knows how to work. The, she knows how to control the ants. She knows how to pretty much work the whole system. But Hank Pym insists that no, you can't go in there. That's not that's not an option. And the reason they kind of get for this is uh, because Hank Pym is just afraid of losing his only family he has left. I buy that. Like even after they sort out their issues um, in the midway point, oddly enough, the part I walked in on, uh, it still made sense to me. And I, I was like, I was like, okay, it's not a great excuse, but it was acceptable enough for me to like go along with it. And guys, remember, this is not the first time they did, did this. They did this with War Machine and Iron Man. I mean, do you think Tony Stark was the most qualified one to wear the Iron Man suit? No. Like, Rhodey was probably way more qualified to wear the Iron Man suit and way more qualified to fight the bad guys. And yet they saved him for the sequel, too. Is this movie going to get a sequel? Eh, I don't, maybe. I don't know. I'm, honestly, I'm not really hoping for it because we did kind of underperform at the box office. Um, but anyway, so, like, I, this is a part where there is, like, I will admit, even, like, as someone who's really enjoyed the Marvel movies up to this point, there is, like, I, I think it is getting to the point where it needs to mix it up a little bit, because they are starting to get a little samey, like, with the humor and the fun tone. It's great, and it works, but at the same time, like, okay, this is starting to become a little redundant. I think Marvel's going to be a little too comfortable in this, so, like, they need to mix it up a little bit. Uh, I mean, granted, the stuff that I liked about this movie was the stuff that was different from the other movies, which is, number one, Scott Lang playing with Paul Rudd, who does, pretty, who does a pretty good job in this role. I mean, it's not the best Paul Rudd movie I've liked him in, but he's still pretty good. But uh, anyway, Scott Lang is, for starters, he's not this big, epic war hero. He's not this, uh, he's not an epic character. He's, he's a thief, a really good thief. Who, uh, who, who's basically just trying to take care of his daughter. That's his main motivation. I mean, there's a great, there's a nice little scale back in terms of tone in this movie, and that's a refreshing change of pace. Um, uh, well, we'll get into something that agree with that in a bit, but, so, apparently Hank Pym is watching Scott Lane, decides that he's a worthy successor to me, uh, because he stole money from rich people once, and basically was a Robin Hood for a day, and that's how he got caught. Um, but for some reason, one reason or another, Hank Pym decides he, he wants Scott Lang to become the next Ant-Man. And then, the, I will give them absolute credit. Like, the way they make Ant-Man's powers in this movie work is great. Like, all the stuff with the Ant-Man costume, even, like, I, I've been kind of beaten on CGI lately, I will admit. But, like, this is a case where I feel like CGI was properly utilized. It was, it had its own style. It had its own form. It had its own flow. And it worked. It worked at making these powers believable. And make them cool. They show that you can make these powers work cinematically. And that was like the big worry a lot of people had, myself included. Like, uh, how can you possibly make this power set work without looking stupid and cheesy? They found a way. And it works really well. And like, this is probably some of my favorite action scenes of all the Marvel movies. Because it's very creative how they do it. Uh, they, they do take full advantage of the concept. And they just have fun with it. Like, uh... Because a large part of this movie is also a superhero movie, is also a heist movie, kind of, in that uh, Ant Man, Hank Pym recruits Scott Lane to become the Ant Man and stop his, I guess, rival slash previous mentee named Alex Cross from uh, developing his own version of the Pym particle, which is what allows you to grow, uh, shrink, and grow at leisure. Uh, but Hank Pym decides, like, no, we can't have that because that's way too much power. It's way too much. We can't have that. We can't let this power out. Alex Cross is not a good man. We can't let him do it. Blah, 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 blah. I, okay, now I, I will, this is like, whether you love this movie or hate this movie or are just kind of indifferent about it, the one thing that everyone kind of agrees on is the fact that the villain is pretty weak in this movie. And yeah, I'd be lying if I say I didn't agree. At the same time, it's also really disappointing because, like, it's played by a really good actor. And I really like this I Like, I've seen this actor in a lot of other stuff. I can't remember his name, but I really like that actor. And, uh, the like, the scenes he has, he's good in them with a little bit better writing. Because this is also maybe the guy who made Anchorman, as, which, as people who watch the show know, not a big fan of that movie. Uh, for reason, I'm not going to get into it. But either way, you can tell, like, I don't know, like, 
I feel like some of the more comedic elements, especially like uh, Scott Lang has these foreign friends who take up way too much screen time. It's it's one of those characters are gonna find them really funny or really annoying. Guess which camp I fall in. <laughs> <laughs> like towards the end I was like oh stop fucking talking just get back to Scott Lang get back to him with like Hank Pym and Hope Van Dyne that's the shit that's interesting that's the shit that's fun I mean because they're better actors and they're doing less like kind of offensive stereotype accents especially one who's doing like a Russian thing I don't know uh they needed a lot less of them there I found them really annoying but uh Again, you can tell... Uh, anymore, was, oh, yeah, Alex Cross. Uh, but, like, the scenes, like... And, by the way, the, the idea of separating uh, Ant-Man and Yellow Jacket by making Yellow Jacket his own person and making him the villain of the movie is very clever uh, twist of the mythology. I like that they did that. I like that twist. I think it's a good way to give Ant-Man a nemesis and make a relatively obscure villain... It's at least a little more interesting. I mean, Alex Cross in the comic books is one of those villains that is so no name. And quite frankly, his power set in the comic books is fucking stupid. Like, it's something involving, like, a nuclear heart that gives him super strength. But so, like, it makes no sense. It's fucking stupid. Uh, so I was okay. Like, I liked the idea of it. I wish the execution was better because, like, it's one of those things... The only impression you get from the entire movie is that uh, Alex Cross does not like Hank Pym because Hank Pym is, I guess he has daddy issues. I don't know. It's never made fully clear. He's just evil. But again, it's played by such a good actor that the scenes he's in are still good and they're still entertaining. And when he actually does become Yellow Jacket at the end and he's holding, spoiler alert, Scott Lang's daughter hostage in her room... He's legitimately creepy. He's legitimately intimidating. And the yellow jacket suit looks pretty good. I mean, he, he sells those scary moments. Where it's like, oh, man, if only you were a better character. This would, be much, this would have had such a bigger impact. But uh, especially, like, it's, it's a reoccurring theme with Marvel movies. Is like, strong heroes, weak villains. There are some exceptions, of course. Like, I like uh, Loki, of course. And even, like, Ultron, I would say is pretty good. Hell, I've made a whole top ten list about it. You can you can go over there for reference. Although, oddly enough, a majority of the people on that list are from other Marvel movies, not made by Marvel Studios. But, uh, anywho. Um, but, yeah, like, they could have done more... Like, I feel like they could have done more with Alex Cross. And, I like, they could, they could have easily cut out a lot of the comedic shtick with the foreign friends to make more development for Alex Cross. It, it could have done that. Easily could have done that. It's like a lot... Enough obnoxious, stupid fucking humor, and give me more of the actual shit that's important, please. Um, uh, but I will say this, I haven't seen Evangeline and Lily in anything in a while. I thought she did really, really well as, uh, Hope Van Dyne. I think she really sold her character. Like, I was worried at first. I was worried at first because it sounded like they were playing her, up, playing her up as just the angry woman who's always just angry to be angry, is always resentful against Scott Lang. Because blah, blah, blah. And she is. And she has valid reasons to be that way. But she does come around. And she has like a very, very good heartfelt moment with Hank Pym at the halfway point. And again, these actors, like when it's focused on Hank Pym, Scott Lane, and Hope Van Dyne, the movie fucking works. It fucking works great. And along with the use of CGI, even like with the training montage as Ant-Man, I thought were really enjoyable. And just like the creativity they use in how they use Ant-Man's powers... And like, and not to mention, they, they define the different types of ants and how uh, these different ants have different abilities and you have to learn how to use which one when and how to use them properly and have these little, like, little tiny ant technology to help them with their... Like, he, he flies on an ant that uh, Scott Lang, Lang calls Antony. Now, ordinarily, I would groan at that pun, but it's... I don't know. It fucking worked for me. It's because it's Paul Rudd doing it. I find him charming, but... Although, it's like, at the same time, uh, spoiler alert... At the very end, uh, Alex Cross ends up shooting and killing Antony, and somehow not killing Scott Lane at the same time. But uh, at the same time, all I could think of was that scene from Monsters, Inc. Because there's a joke earlier on in the movie, because it's the same bug that uh, Scott Lane escapes prison from, because he gets arrested for stealing the Ant-Man suit and then trying to return it, but the cops are waiting for him, because he'll... Anywho, it's complicated. Uh, but... 
So he escapes from prison on this ant because Hank Pym helps him out. And they just call him, like, Ant 2... And Hank Pym just calls him Ant 247. And he goes, well, he needs a proper name. So during the train, something goes, I'm going to call you Antony. And you just hear that throughout then. I knew right then, like, fuck, that ant's going to fucking die. And yeah, it does. And all I could think of is that scene from Monsters, Inc. When uh, he's explaining to Sully, he's like, no, no, no. You do not... You do not give a name to it. Otherwise, you get attached to it. Now, put that thing back where it came from, or so help me! Put that thing back where it came from, or so help me. Hey, sorry. <laughs> oh, God, I'm, I'm alone, and I still do this shit. I'm talking loudly to my camera, even though there's, like, nobody else in this house. Uh, <laughs> this is what I'm doing in my life. Nah, I take it back. I love doing it. Who am I kidding? Uh, anywho. Uh, but, yeah, other than that, like, I really like what they do with the character. I think they did a nice blend of, uh, taking stuff from the comics, but also doing their own thing with it that make it fit into the Marvel Universe and the Avengers Universe. Like, uh, I feel like if you haven't seen the movie yet, uh, skip to a couple minutes ahead, because this is a pleasant surprise I didn't know about. Uh, I saw a brief glimpse of, like, a TV spot, otherwise I never would have known this was in here. But, uh, so you've been warned. So, uh, it turns out Scott Lang needs to do an airdrop to this, what they think is an old Tony Stark, like an old Stark warehouse. Little do they know when they get that, to steal like an old uh, Howard Stark technology. But when they get there, it turns out that uh, it's the new Avengers facility that was established in Age of Ultron. And uh, he, when he gets there, he ends up fighting the Falcon. And misunderstandings occur, and they end up fighting. And... It's a really cool fight. It really is. Like, it's a really good fight. And it's cool. It's it's kind of a tease to Civil War, because we know Ant-Man's Ant going to be in Civil War, and so was the Falcon. So you see that kind of back and forth. It's, it's a really good fight scene, and I, that's one of those things. It's a nice, pleasant surprise. It's really cool to see, like... It's cool to see, like, his inner conflicts. Now you have enough superheroes in the Marvel Universe that you can start doing this kind of thing outside of the Avengers. It's pretty cool. I like that they can do that. I like that they have flexibility to do that. And it does add in, like, to the extended connection, connected universe. Granted, this is, stuff like that is probably why Edgar Wright left the project. Uh, as well as it, it's kind of fun watching the movie, trying to pick what parts were from Edgar, were Edgar Wright's ideas, and what part, uh, what ideas were the, the other people's, I, the other director, I don't know his name, I apologize, but... Like, you can tell, like, a lot of the creativity, I feel like a lot of the setup was, it's too creative to be the Anchorman guy. Like, a lot of the setup with Hank Pym being a World War II veteran, with Hope Van Dyne becoming the new Wasp, with uh, this, the, the very clever way they both incorporate both Hank Pym and Scott Lane as Ant-Man. Like, they're both Ant-Man, but Scott Lane is the most current one. It's a very clever way to work around the issues of the comics, and not having Hank Pym being some young guy... Uh, and all that, and still being able to clue Scott Lane. It's like, the way they super vent that, as well as, like, the yellow jacket thing, it's all very clever. Uh, I guess I heard that Hope Van Dyme's role in the original script that Edgar Wright wrote was significantly minimal. Uh, so I'm glad they flew was able to flesh that out, because, again, Hope Van Dyme is one of the better characters in the movie. And, like, her parts work. I, I have a feeling that the... a lot of the shtick with, like, the three... the the three stooges, I'm just gonna call them, that are in the movie. I'm willing to bet that was probably more the Anchorman guy. I could be wrong. I don't know. Uh, I could be very wrong. Uh, is there anything else to talk about this movie? I mean, I guess I just need to talk about the post credit scenes, or at least I should. Uh, oh, by the way, I heard there's, like, like, towards the end, there's this whole thing where, uh, like, you, as the Ant-Man, or was shrinking to you, you cannot shrink down to a molecular level, otherwise you'll end up shrinking forever because reasons. And, uh... Oh, sorry, I just got really tired all of a sudden. It's late. This is like, uh, it's almost 11 o'clock over here. Uh, I, I'm getting, I'm a little bit, like, I fall, I've fallen a bit behind this week. I was meant to get more done, but I've been pointing it off. Uh, anyway, they go subatomic, it's shrinking forever to, like, this, uh, up this... Molecular dimension, I forget what they call it. I heard there's some kind of Easter egg in there. I didn't catch it, uh, but I'm curious to see if anyone did. So if you did, you know what I'm talking about. Leave us something in the comments, because I'm not going to know what it is. And I haven't got a chance to see the movie again, so I, I can't picture it and I can't point it out. Because it is very surreal-esque 2001 Space Odyssey kind of stuff, so I don't know what's going on. 
But anywho, uh, there is like I did like the accidental uh, Easter egg for Spider Man, which like well, let's see. I don't know if they put that in there later, as of like hoping they would get the Spider Man rights while they were making it, and it just worked out well, or they just threw in there just uh, they just kind of threw shit at the wind. Uh, as like towards the end, because apparently after Scott Lyons fight fight with Ant Man. Uh, he just, Falcon tries to track him down, and he runs into one person who says, like, I'm, I'm looking for some, I'm looking for a super-powered person, and he goes, well, which one? We got people that swing now, we got people that crawl on walls, which, if you didn't know when this movie was made, it's easy to interpret it as a Spider-Man reference, and maybe that was, like, a sneaky way to try to introduce him in the universe before the Sony, the deal came in, like, as to try to start pressuring Sony to do that, if they didn't already agree before this movie came out. Uh, but now that the deal with Sony has worked out, it is a nice little nod to Spider-Man. It's like, cool, we got Spider-Man in this universe now. Yay! Uh, hopefully that won't bomb. Um, uh, and then there's the, uh, there, there's two after credit scenes. Uh, like, oh, uh, the, the Winter Soldier at the end makes a cameo in this movie. Uh, uh like, I'm wondering how they're gonna handle Captain America after Phase 3, because... Steve Rout, like, Chris Evans has already said he's done with the character after these next couple movies. After the Avengers movies are done, he's done with the character. Uh, which is directed by the Russo brothers, who directed Captain America 2. Which was, it's so far, as far as I'm concerned, easily the best of the Marvel movies. Because it does do things different, it does take risks, it does change the game. It's what, it's kind of what the Marvel movies need right now, is they need to mix things up. Um, uh, but anywho... Uh, but yeah, like, it was a nice little nod, it's a nice little tease to Captain America 3, it kind of already teases at the void developing between Tony Stark and Captain America, so we'll see where it goes, um, I'm curious, it sounds like they're gonna recruit Ant-Man be on Steve, on Captain America's side, I don't know, it'll be curious to see where that goes, uh, I can't really think of any, like, I can't even remember what the first credits, after credits scene was, shit. Oh, you're right, that was the Wasp thing. I already talked about that. Oh, one other thing, and this is kind of a nitpick, but it did bug me, is the fact that uh, I was disappointed that there was a kind of romance that happened between Scott Lane and Hope Van Dyne, because I did not get much chem sexual chemistry from them at all over the course of the movie. I got a good friendship vibe, but I didn't get any, oh, these two want to fuck kind of vibe from them. It was like, really? We're going that direction? Okay, okay. Uh, whatever, have it your way. Uh, I mean, granted, it's in a it's in a five second scene, so it's not like they make a huge emphasis on that. But that Hank Pym does walk in the making out, so I don't know. Make it that way, you will. Uh, that it, it was not a huge deal, but it bugged me. It was like really, they don't really have a sexual chemistry. That like I can see them as good buddies. That's pretty cool. Uh, honestly, I can't think of too much else to talk about other than yeah, I really liked the movie. I thought it was really solid. Uh, but I do think it is also showing that the Marvel formula is starting to get a little bit redundant. Civil War should shake things up nicely, because there's no way you can make a story with, like, friend versus friend into, like, a cheery, fun, two-hour romp. So that, that that's gonna have some dark shit, so we'll see where that goes. Uh, in that case, like, yeah, so far I'd say Phase 2 is a pretty grand success, and even though... Ant-Man didn't do well domestically. I think it still made like 500 million worldwide. So it's still, I would say, it's still technically a success. But anywho, we'll see what happens with the next Marvel movie. Otherwise, I was, I like this one pretty good. Uh, I didn't catch trailers because, like I said, I showed right as the movie started. Oh, uh, I there was one other funny, little funny thing that happened at my showing is there's a little girl in the movie that, for the most part, I guess just got really bored and she started walking up and down the stairs, kind of stomping around, blah, blah, blah. God bless the mother. She was doing her best to keep his child out of control, but she was clearly bored until, like, the very end, which apparently just kept her attention. And then, uh, at, at the credits start rolling, I hear her turn to her mother and just go, Okay. Answer cool now. Just proclaimed it. Just proclaimed that. Yeah, all right. I've decided this day that ants are fish in a coo. Anyone that defies my work can suck it. Uh, I don't know, made me chuckle. Uh, yeah, I think that's all I got for Ant-Man, so uh, tune in. I think uh, next week we got Pixels, which uh, I'm not looking forward to. Uh, Paper Town, and we still got to check out Mr. Holmes, so means that we're going to try to find time to do that. 
So, yep, that's all we got for this week, guys. Thank you all for watching. See you all next time. I gotta get off the couch. Ah!